going to start now. Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Dick and I are so happy once again to be joined by Reverend Peter Larman. Reverend Peter Larman is a retired minister who formerly led Progressive Christians Uniting here in Los Angeles. He no longer lives in Los Angeles, but that's where we met. And we actually met, Peter, because you were um, the executive director at that time. And I found, oh my gosh, they're progressive Christians. And I and I tried to find a way to connect with you and did. And boy, am I happy I did that. Yeah. So thank I'm you, here. Peter, for writing this really great piece. Um, I am going to let you tell us about this piece that is called White Men Clinging to Power more than a Biden problem. Indeed, indeed. And uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me uh, uh, try something this uh, weird and uh, to some people perverse. Um, what I mean by that is um, there's a couple things going on. So I'm talking about the, the very visible problem of white people, white men who won't go away no matter what. Uh, a persisting problem. And then I se segue into a, a much longer discussion of lonely, damaged uh, white men in history. Um, and a couple of people who've, who've read this piece have said to me, well, Peter, um, you took the long way around the barn here. I mean, come on. You could have simply said um, that these people are... Um, you know, they lack proper nurturing, they lack community, they lack friends. Um, they're speaking, of course, of the loners, you know, of the, of the uh, you know, the psycho killers. And pro the problem there is um, it, it's, um, there are plenty of people, white men, who have plenty of nurturing and still have this problem uh, because of the cultural uh, inheritance. So, yeah, my point of departure was, Biden finally says, okay, I'll step down, but only after massive amounts of pressure. We have no idea what those phone calls were like. Someday that'll probably be reported. Um, and I thought, huh, it's obviously not just him. If you look around at other, other politicians who, who hang on and hang on and hang on, and business leaders and culture leaders, um, it's a, I mean, there's a, a long, long, long cavalcade of people who just just will not get out of the way that you know the ahab types so to speak on the on the ship um and um uh, and i think it's going to become well, uh, still more acute as um as white males broadly speaking continue to say well who are we now you know what what happened to us you know, we were at the top of the food chain, and now we're being told we can't we can't uh, uh, hold to uh, these positions any longer. There's got to be something wrong with that. And of course, in that sense of loss and sense of displacement, there's there's uh, an element of danger. So anyway, there's everything but the kitchen sink in this particular article, and I I I, I hope that doesn't trouble the readers too much because sometimes a ramble is a good thing. And sometimes a counterintuitive way of looking at something is also a good thing. Yeah. So, I mean, you say it's more than a Biden problem, but it, but Biden really puts a, a real spotlight on the problem. And it's not just Joe Biden. I mean, the people around him in his staff and high level Democrats in the media have known for a couple of years that his gears were slipping. It was obvious. So they hid him from the public. He didn't do press conferences. They, they corralled how he would speak to people, and, and they're complicit in this. I mean, uh, he has plainly been not up to the job that he's doing, never mind campaigning for doing the job going forward. And, and I would say that's true of others. I mean, you talk about white men, but, but there were images of Dianne Feinstein's staff wheeling into, into the halls of the Senate in a, in a wheelchair and it was clear that she didn't, and, and reports were she didn't have the faintest idea what was going on. But because she wouldn't say I'm out, uh, her staff, I, I think to, to keep their jobs or out of some misguided sense of loyalty or lack of patriotism, kept pushing her. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is another. 
Charles Grassley, what is he over 90? I mean, these it's it's uh, it, it is a real problem, you know. So so I want to if I if, if I if I can jump in here. Um, one of the questions that you ask is, what is it about white men, especially older white men, that find it so hard to surrender the spotlight? And when I was reading that, it, I began to reflect on my own life. You know, I worked for NASA for um, over 20 years. And there was a manager there who was the manager of two highly successful uh, spaceflight projects. And as he aged, he was really finding it difficult to retire. And we became close friends, you know, after 20 years. And he said to me one day, he says, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that people don't just jump when I say jump. You know, when I walk into a room, he says, I'm accustomed to everybody just doing what I say to do. He says, but somehow he says, and then he said to me, and I thought this was really insightful. He says, I'm beginning to see what your lived experience is like. Speaking to me, this is what he says <laughs> wow, to me. Wow, wow. And so when you ask the question, what is it about white men? I thought about him and I thought about what he said. And I think that they, our society treats them as the apex of humanity as this is the standard that represents the best of all there is to be human. And, and that in, that also includes age. Um, so as they get older, they're beginning to see, oh, all the things that I thought that I got out of merit, I didn't necessarily get that out of merit. Um, now that I'm slipping a little bit, I'm beginning to see what it's like for other people. Maybe that plays in. Yes, but I think your your colleague at NASA was exceptionally insightful uh, in that uh, he was maturing with a degree of grace and 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 uh, perception of how things actually are. Our our core problem is that is the number of people, and again, I'll say white men don't have that uh, grace at all, who are still convinced, no matter what that they are the people who deservedly should command and control. Um, that that's, that's really the problem. And Dick, to your point about, about Diane Feinstein, and by the way, you guys published a wonderful piece uh, uh, about this uh, by Nick, somebody, I'm, I just uh, uh, read it a short while ago, a, a, a young scholar who mentions that Chuck, Chuck Schumer had two conversations with uh, Senator Feinstein about stepping down. He had to have the second one because she couldn't recall having the first one. But I say in my piece that I think women, certainly women of my age cohort, uh, will often hang on in part because they feel that they've had to fight, and, that, and they're right, they've had to fight much, much harder to attain positions of prominence than the men. The men generally kind of had it handed to them. Uh, and that will change over time. That will change. But it's a dangerous uh, uh, it's a dangerous period of transformation when the anxieties of the powerful white men are are stoked, you know, by all of this sort of threat to their to what they consider many of them to be their natural preeminence. So so Dick kind of uh, tapped into the fact that there are a lot of enablers around Biden. And I'd like to expand that and say that our society as a whole is an enabler to this kind go. of masculinity that turns into toxic masculinity because there's this sense of entitlement that, well, I should be the one that's in control of everything. And once that begins to reveal that it's not true, there's, there's a problem. I, I just, I wanted to talk about society um, contributing to this because after reading your piece, I was thinking about people like Elizabeth Holmes, um, who worked at lowering the tone of her voice. Remember Elizabeth Holmes, the famous it's, it's young um, Theranos. Theranos of, of Theranos yeah. fame. She lowered the tone of her voice. Now, I don't know if she knew this intuitively or if someone told her this, but Margaret Thatcher also took voice lessons to lower the tone of her voice so that she could gain more um, credibility as a leader. And I've never read this, but I, I have seen this with Oprah Winfrey. 
I never read it anywhere, but I just remember, you can go back and listen to Oprah Winfrey interviews when she first started and then listen to her interviews like after the Oprah Winfrey show became very popular. She's like two, two tones deeper. So I think that we as a society, we respect, admire, and uplift masculinity. Um, so we're, we're all enablers of this. We all are. And, and uh, in fact, in churches, and I've seen this now in multiple congregations, including the one uh, I attend here in, in Rhode Island, um, in churches, often it's, it's women, and women really are the leaders for all practical purposes in every congregation I've ever known. They put in the work, they're on the committees, they contribute more money, more time, more everything, more love to the institution. Um, we now have a, a female a senior minister for the first time in this particular congregation's 305 year history. And um, it's some of the older women in the church who don't, who just can't quite accept that. Um, this is particularly pronounced because churches are are enormously patriarchal for obvious historical reasons uh, to begin with. But uh, there's something about voice. You mentioned voice. I, I hear women say to me, in fact, I will guest preach there. And always afterwards, the women flock around me and say, oh, my God, that's so beautiful. And you have such a beautiful voice. So I, I understand uh, women... Uh, being being pegged with this idea of being shrill and so forth have to have to uh, adjust and say pay attention to me uh, I'm speaking in a in a level tone that is to say I am I am requiring your attention I I found that I, when I passed the age and Dick you you have to tell me if this is true of you when I passed the age of fifty. I found lots of people in everyday encounters in supermarkets or wherever saying, um, uh, yes, sir, to me. I get, do you get the sir treatment? Yes, sir. Like you're a patriarch already? You I don't get I, that. I, I have it. <laughs> yes, I, I think that's true. I, I was going to say, you know, it, it's understandable why people like Joe Biden and Chuck Grassley and, and, and the people in history stay in those positions. I, I mean, Joe Biden is the center of the world with with staffs of people to to uh, to carry him around the country to fetch him coffee i mean and it's true of chuck grassley and and anybody else you can name it it is probably hard to step away from that being the center of attention being the command of everything you see but i guess the question is i mean Time after time, that does a disservice to the the job that they think that they they're serving. Yeah, just like what he was asking you, the respect that you get. You know, Dick and I have together. We've published the LA Progressive for seventeen, going on eighteen years. Right. And um, early on, whenever we go to some kind of event where we'd be introduced as the publisher and editor of the LA Progressive, people would always compliment Dick. Or, you know, all that he did with the LA Progressive. And I'm standing right there. And, <laughs> yep. and, uh, yep. Dick, I get to, to see it. <laughs> yeah, Dick began to, to notice it. it. It's something that he probably would not have noticed it, you know, had I not been standing right there and had he not been so acutely aware of how much I do and how much he does. And we both, we work, we work in kind of we naturally taking on different roles at the LA Progressive, but we work equally hard. But yet he's the one who naturally is given all of the accolades for creating the LA Progressive. Well, beyond that, we also see a certain d division on who contacts us and for what on email. Certain groups of people will contact me like I'm in charge, but then other people will contact you. It is true. The sisters do reach out. Right. <laughs> I'm not talking about the people who reach out to you. <laughs> <laughs> well you model i mean you model uh how to do this how to how to how to share uh power and how to share the uh, spotlight but but you have to make a conscious effort because otherwise yeah that pattern recurs and recurs and recurs and of course now we have you know this colossal challenge in terms of the harris candidacy uh and this is this is a question of 
you know, grace and insight, really. Um, and a lot of people are asking it, will, will Americans find it possible, Americans who are patterned in the way we've been talking about, find it possible to understand that, uh, that this candidate for president has everything she needs to be a superb uh, leader? And what does she have to do to communicate that? Of course, um, uh, it is. It, it's going to be. You know, it's going to be. Believe me, some very bright people are giving this a lot of thought all the time. As is the candidate herself. It's. It's more than a question of putting all the pieces together in terms of the different cohorts within the party and the donors and all that kind of stuff. It's um, psychologically, how does this read? I mean, we know, we know what what her opposition is going to throw at her. Obviously, right? Um, you know, my my hope, of course, is uh, that the you know the lower they go, the more people will will say that's preposterous. But we don't know that. So um, there's a a certain large segment of society that wouldn't dream of voting for a black woman, a woman, a black person. But they weren't going to anyway. They weren't going to vote for Biden. They're already in the Trump camp. But the upside is Kamala Harris, by virtue of her record, but also her, her who she is and her race, and her, she's going to she is exciting parts of the populace that were turned off by the current race between two ancient men. Yep, I got it. I got that. I got that. I got that. And. Um... And also, I have to say, um, the articles about what are white women going to do uh, have have been endlessly fascinating to me. The 39 million uh, white women, the largest single block of uh, of voters, and can they see? Can uh, the preponderance of them see how this plays into their self understanding and and um, and and you know the future? Um, that will be the that will be the the key. Yeah, I, I think that, I think you're right. I think that that is the the key demographic, especially when you consider that more white men, uh, more white women voted for Donald Trump in 2016 than voted for Hillary Clinton. And it is it is perplexing. I think that our biggest challenge is really to tap into the unconscious of the nation those people who believe that they're not biased, but they hold these very biased um, opinions about what leadership looks like, um, what, it, what it sounds like to be a credible, intelligent, uh, to be an intellectual, the tone of your voice matters, um, how much um, emotion you display in the way that you communicate, how much, how often you use your hands, all of these unconscious signals, um, We've been um, socialized to believe that there is just one look for what leadership is. And it's almost everything that is the opposite of Kamala Harris. Right. It's uh it's uh unsmiling and snarling. I, I think I think um and I'm beginning to see this in Harris a sense of freedom, of inner freedom, where she can laugh and really laugh. Do you know what I mean? Not not fake laugh, but really, really kind of enjoy herself in public. People adore that. If a if a if a political leader can do that, particularly when Trump has never been seen ever engaging in genuine laughter, we see him smirk, we see him sneer, but we never see him kind of chuckle. Yeah. Have, have you ever? Ever. You know, have, never. I don't even think I've ever seen his teeth, his top teeth. I've never seen him grin, smile. He doesn't even have any no, smile lines. He, he doesn't has, have smile lines on him. He has a, a fake kind of smile. He stretches his face out. And it <laughs> but I, I mean, it's kind of a weird kind of smile. But I think that, that Peter is right. Kamala's authenticity is what is very attractive. Yeah, yeah. When she just settles in and just is just her natural self, whether her natural self is the big smiling, laughing Kamala, or whether the natural self is okay. Last question, I've had enough. But she can get down to some serious business, oh, yeah. and that oh, is yeah. an authentic Kamala as well. Right. So, right. 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 but 
Right. Is this country ready for that? So, so I got to say, I, I've been deeply discouraged by this race for the past number of months, obviously because of Trump. That would be such a disaster. It, I mean, before he was malevolent, but he was incompetent. But now he may bring heightened malevolence with a certain degree of competence. So, so that was terrible. But I, you know, I've been mad for a long time that Joe Biden was hanging in because I could see you could see by his shuffle and by his, you know, they were they were covering it up. But it was true. And all that is to say that when when we heard that Joe Biden was stepping aside and recommending uh, Kamala Harris, I may have told you this before, but I spontaneously broke out in tears. I I couldn't. Did you? I, Me too. Me too. Yeah, me too. I, and I'm still feeling, I'm still feeling that, I'm still feeling that relief. Um, you know, I also feel the anxiety. I think we all feel knowing it will be close and also knowing, also knowing that regardless of the legal outcome of the 2024 presidential election, there will be a, a, a denial. There, you know, they've, they've, they've already, they've already got their uh, plans uh, afoot there, and with the courts and so forth being what they are, yeah, there's still reason to be worried. But but yes, let's enjoy the relief while we can. I do want to say about the article. You know, I I say some things there about the spiritual poverty of American uh, males through the uh, generations. I can't say enough about how happy I was as a young reader to discover that 1923 D.H. Lawrence book on classic American literature, because it, it, it's, it's real thin, but real solid. And he says, these loners uh, are in your literature. You know, he's an English writer, obviously. Um, look, just read your own literature. Read James Fenimore Cooper, you know, the, the, the Deerslayer. And you'll understand that, um, that, that, that's who you are in a way. You're, you're, you know, a bunch of lonely dudes out there in the wilderness, and you're killers, basically. Um, I, he I heard a psychiatrist say to me uh, uh, the other day, she thinks that these uh, so-called lone wolf people, the the crookses and all the rest of them, uh, may have fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, uh, some may have that. I don't know, uh, I, but. But I, I want it to be the both and. That is to say, uh, I want to understand clearly that there are problems with nurture and, and loneliness and online um, craziness, of course. And then there is also this long, long, long uh, uh, parade of people who come from this uh, same kind of desperate place who have, who, 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 who do really have no place of grace in their lives. And what are we going to do about that? Um, we can say, well, you know, they need to stop bowling alone. They need to form meaningful friendships and all that kind of stuff. You know, you, we can wring our hands and, and reach on that all we want, but who's reaching, who's going to reach out to these people? And again, go ahead. Well, but you but you make the point. So in literature, there's oftentimes been this this lonely man who conquers the day. But look at what we've done with our movies and television. I mean, Rambo and John Wayne. And, I mean, that's the thing that you and I and all our years were raised up. You idolize this one man who can come in and, and I'm the only one that can do this. And we hear this echo in our, our elections. And 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 you're right. So so I don't know if it's fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, but I know it's if you hear the same message 10,000 times when before you're 21, you're going to absorb some of it. And that there message, really, it, that message dominates con right now. It dominates the airways. I mean, if you have um, a subscription to Netflix or Prime Video or Hulu and you just scan through and look at the movies, it's always some guy, a lone, lone guy with a gun who's coming in to save the day. That, that I I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that represents a good 75% of what's uh, what's being shown. And that's why it's so easy for me to find what we'll, what we'll watch. Yeah, and that's why I only <laughs> want to watch documentaries. <laughs> I, uh, a couple of years ago, I stumbled on a program called, I think it's called Reacher or something like that. 
I had I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't watch a single episode. But, you know, it's it's one of these persons who's a, a, a guy who's sort of part android or something. I don't know. Um, it it's just you know it's it's ghastly. But you're right. Uh, here I'm looking at the musty bookshelf of the 19th century, and Dick is saying, "I don't have to, I don't need your bookshelf. I could just go, go on Hulu and find what you're talking about." <laughs> Yeah, we, we just have a steady diet of that. It's it's more so, I mean, if you use um, movies to sort of gauge where we are as a society, that theme of this lone white man with the gun coming to save the day, you see that more in the United States than you do in Europe. Because we Dick and I watch a lot of um, European programming. And so you, you see that that theme more in the United States. And I do think that it is a contributing factor that coupled with the easy availability of guns, um, it is a, a, a fact. And, I, and because it is a factor that's coming through the movies, maybe it's a factor that can be controlled. If there's some intention behind controlling it, I've never even heard of anyone taking it seriously from the perspective that you're talking about, Peter, these, these lonely young men. Let's yeah. uh, let's project let's project into the future, shall we? Let's give ourselves this um, this tonic uh, right now and say that in the Harris presidency, the Harris we have to say the Harris blank testimony for now, uh, there will actually be some serious attention paid to this culture, right? To this 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 cultural problem to all aspects of it to the economic challenge obviously of uh, a vast number of of uh white men who are in some ways economically superfluous now uh, um more than ever before uh but not just that dimension of it right to the you know to the spiritual healing dimension and and how how that might take shape um you know the right will hate that because the right the right inevitably when any kind of discussion like this comes along they're like well that's you know that's exactly what we refuse that's exactly the medicine we don't want to hear about you know because there's nothing wrong with us right if yeah. you say so <laughs> get out of my way you know in your piece you took when you you give examples of people who um, refuse white men who refuse to give up their domain. Um, but one person you said that um, represents a departure from that is Robert Reich. And I agree, Robert Reich is a departure from that. But then I thought about his height. And I think that when someone doesn't have it all, all the things that our society considers the apex, because he's dealt with heightism his entire life, um, there's a part of him that is somewhat humbled. I mean, these experiences, I think, help to shape you. Maybe yes, you, know. and you you published a piece uh, of his, but I I think I I seen a couple of these where he in a in a self reflective and good humored way simply thinks about you know uh, what he can and cannot do. And you're right. I think I think working from limitations yeah. and and uh, a degree of you know uh, experienced contempt. Uh, uh, may may make a difference. Um, Joe Biden is uh, exceptionally tall. That may be one of his liabilities. Yeah, yeah, tall and and by our standards, he's a good looking man. Um, he he did have the awful experience of losing his wife and and his daughter, and you know having the car accident with the sons early on. So that humbled him a bit. But he has all was born with all the stuff that America says is the right stuff, and and now his right stuff is fading. But you have to admire the fact that he overcame a, a severe stutter. stutter. Yeah. And and I, I do understand that he would not want to leave. I mean, you know, he's been taught here for a long time that he is the center of the universe and he alone can handle it. But the people I blame are the people around him who now apparently are quite upset at the Democrats who, who urged him to leave or forced him out. And, and shame on them. They could see what was going on. And they chose to gaslight the public. I mentioned two of them by name in the piece because I thought I should. Steve Ricchetti and uh, Mike Donilon, yes. Rhode Island's Mike Donilon, a couple of hardcore old pals. Uh, there are others in that inner circle, but uh, 
but they bear a particular amount of blame because they just uh they just you know they just doubled down they're just like no no we're not we're not going to yield luckily there was nancy pelosi yeah exactly and how appropriate is that that's perfect perfect well peter thank you again for uh gifting us this beautiful piece that we can share with the LA Progressive community. And we really encourage everyone, if you like what Peter writes, um, share it, you know, click like, share it, share it on all the various social media platforms. That's the only way the independent media gets to, to, to reach out to a, a broader, wider community. So thanks again, Peter. Thank you. And people should feel free to disagree as well. It's, it, it, believe me, uh, I, I put my oar in the water, but it's not the only oar. This is wonderful to get together with you. It's not quite as good as when you lived out here and we could actually go downtown and have a meeting with you. But thank God for technology. Yeah. 20 years ago, we wouldn't be doing this. Okay. And, thanks for, and thanks for keeping it going, really. Thank you. Have a good Peace. one. Peace. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.